Good morning, Emmanuel Fellowship. That was weak. All right, let's do it again. Good morning, Emmanuel Fellowship. I'm glad you guys don't play the drums. Keep keep rhythm. That was a little out of tune, but thank you. I, um, as Pastor Chris said, we met together probably around five months ago. Um, when he came here at first, he said, you know, would you ever be interested in speaking? And I was like, well, there's something that God laid on my heart, and we talked about timing, and it's about f- uh, family. First things first is the series we're going over. He asked me to end it, and what God has really laid on my heart is a love for family, a love for students, and um, it's something that I really felt like I need to share with you today. Um, first of all, I, my, again, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is JJ. Um, I've been here for about Emmanuel for 15 years, a long time, has been working with youth pretty much the entire time during that. Um, I also have my teaching degree, and I taught um, at a level three behavior disorder school for three years, and if you don't know what that is, for kids who get kicked out of other schools, they come to my, my, they came to my school, and I could tackle them and do things like that, so that was fun. Um, not really, but it was a uh, it was a great experience because it really showed me and deepened my love for students who have, who are hurting, um, kids who are hurting and opened my eyes to a much larger world and much larger problem that a lot of times we don't see. Um, and family is, is also important to me because I have young kids, little kids. And um, first of all, I want to introduce my wife if she can stand up. This is Bethany. We can cheer for her. And if you knew what I put her through every day, you would cheer a lot louder because she puts up a ton for me. Um, I'm obnoxious, if you don't know me, and I'm always like that. So um, she also homeschools her kids, so she's busy, and she does a great, great job. Amazing. Um, And I also have some pictures of my kids, so if we can go to that. This is Natalie and Levi. If you guys can say, aw. You know, that was... if you can do it louder, because I'm going to tell them how loud you were with them, how much you love them. So let's try again. Ready? Aww. Perfect, perfect. Um, these are my joy, um, my pride. Two of them. I have another one, so I'm not forgetting him. Next one. And this is Noah. Uh, he's in the slide. Yeah. He is our little fireball. Um, he is crazy, and he is three now, and he is emotional and everything like that. So... Um, one thing, I was trying to think of a story in my life that can encapsulate kind of what parenting and family is about, and what I was thinking was my first Father's Day. Um, my daughter, who's eight now, is when she was six months old. I was so excited when she was born. I was like, oh, I'm a daddy. She's beautiful, and she didn't, couldn't talk back. It was great. She just sat there. Um, I could put her somewhere, and she would just stay, and, um, but I, it was Father's Day, and I, every day, you know, you know, I think your kids probably did this. Well, why don't I get it? Why isn't there a kid's day? And I was like, well, you know, every day is a kid's day. And I understand that now that I'm a father. But, you know, I finally had it. It was my day. It's Father's Day. It was my first Father's Day. I get to celebrate now. I was excited. I was like, yes. I woke up, Bethany. I was like, hey, it's Father's Day. Natalie can't do anything, so it's on you. Um, but, but anyway, so I pick up Natalie. I woke her up. She's waking up. She's like, oh, you know, but smiling. She's beautiful. And I put her like this, it was, it was one of those moments that could have been on a card, you know, like, like a Hallmark card that you could sell, it was great, and then God, um, he likes to humiliate me all the time, <laughs> so what happens is I hold her up, and since she's five months old, I can't say anything, I'm like, oh, happy Father's Duh, and as soon as I say Duh, she spit up, and of course, <laughs> at the angle I had her, being stupid, is she spits up, it comes right into my mouth, it was disgusting. I almost dropped her, but I didn't because I'm a great dad, you know. <laughs> After all that, I sat her down, and, like, and my wife's laughing. She's like, oh. She's like, that was your present, honey. I'm like, thanks so much. But I think that really shows what parenting is about. You know, it's great. You have a beautiful, you have kids, they're great, they're wonderful, and they spit up on you. They're messy, they're nasty. They put you through things you never thought you'd go through. They um, are exciting and horrible at the same time. Not horrible. I didn't say that. Take that back. 
<laughs> Explain that. <laughs> um, so one thing I do want to go on, though, is um, what our kids are going through now is different than many of us while we went through their, through their age. It's a different world out there. And we have to understand that when we're raising our kids, when you are taking care, when you have your grandkids talking to them, your great grandkids, or students around. Um, and so we can have uh, the worldview. Uh, is that up there now? All right, next generation. And we're going to be talking about different, what a biblical worldview is. Because 70% of Christian people today in America say they're Christians. Now, if you look out, and look how people are living, you say, really? And there's a reason for that. What a biblical worldview is, and people who have that, is a lot different than what people say, I believe, I, I'm a Christian. Uh, what a biblical worldview entails is absolute truth exists. The Bible is accurate in everything it teaches. Satan is considered to be a real being or force. You cannot earn your way to heaven by being a good person. Jesus lived a sinless life. God is all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world and is still ruling today. And that is something most of us can agree on. It's not anything that's really far out there that would divide the church in half. No, this is pretty fundamental stuff. Now remember, 70%, so that's 7 out of 10 people say they're Christians. Uh, how many percentage do you think would say, agree with this here, everything here? It is only, it goes from that 70% down to 9%. 9%. And if you're real with yourself and you look out and you people you talk to, you will see this. It is a different world that we're growing up with now than we, we did before. Um, if you want to turn to your Bibles to John 15, 18 through 19. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. It's not a comforting verse. Doesn't that make you feel really warm and fuzzy? And the next verse, Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason I share these verses is because we're called out to be different. We're called out to not be the same as the world. And we live in a nation that was founded on Christian principles, and I believe many of us got comfortable in that. We were able to serve God, and, you know, we didn't, a lot of us didn't get as much hate as we're getting now. Um, and our families need to see that we're able to be different. Our kids need to see that because they're going to have to be different if they're going to serve God. They have to have that. They have to have that ability because if they go up and say, I'm a Christian, I believe in this, this, and this, they're going to be called names. They're going to be called bigots and all sorts of things, and they're going to have to deal with that. They're going to have to see us as parents, as grandparents, as their leaders, being able to step in that and take that on too. So we're, if God tells you to share your faith, let your kids see you share your faith. If, our, if, you know, if you feel God telling you to go give and live your life differently, not just to, what God, what, what can I do to earn the most for me? That's what everybody, that's what your kids see everybody doing. If they see you live your lives differently, they're going to see that. We have to be examples for them. And um, as I said before, I taught at, it was called Alpha School, and God really, um, my heart there. I saw some things there that it was horrible. I mean, I saw some horrible things there. The students, you're like, how can a student just be crazy in school? Well, there's, there's reasons why. There's reasons for that. One of my students, um, and he was a great, a great kid, outstanding. I mean, he, there was, he was at Alpha for a reason, so there was some behavior issues there, but he was smart. He was intelligent. Um, and I, you know, one time I was just talking to him, I said, you know, how are you doing? He said, well, JJ, you know, I'm or Mr. Moss, we call him Mr. Moss because I was a teacher. He said, Mr. Moss, I was, you know, I'm really trying hard to stay clean, and, but it's really hard when I go home and my mom's high all the time. And it is, that would be, that would be hard. That's his reality. That's, 
his life. That's what he's growing up in. I also had two students there um, where one was a junior in high school, one was a senior in high school, and they, I mean, they, they knew each other at Alpha for, for about a year. And they found out after knowing each other for a year that they were brother and sister. They didn't know it. They, they shared the same father, so they were stepbrother and stepsister. Um, both of them were, you know, both were in foster care. And it was, I mean, how do I talk to this, something? How, what do I say about that? It's, it's hard. That's their reality. It, they're growing up, and it's, it's, it's tough. It's very tough. And kids in our church, some of them are going through extremely tough, tough things. Very hard. I mean, I, I was a youth pastor here before Adam. Um, and me and Bethany, we would be up at night talking and saying, what do we do with, for them? How do we step in there? Uh, we would be, I mean, we'd be crying. It, it, would be, it would be hard. They're going through tough things, and they need us as a family, as a church family, to come alongside. Um, now, I want to get a little interactive, so you're going to have to move a little bit. Sorry. But raise your hand if you have grandkids. Raise your hand. Keep your hand up. Don't put them down. Wow, that's, I almost got them all there. All right, raise your, now keep them up. Raise your hand if you have great grandkids. And keep, everyone keep your hands up here. Raise your hand. I'm sorry, I'll do this fast. Uh, keep your hands, now raise your hands up if you have children at all. If you have children. Now raise your hands if you ever knew somebody younger than you. Raise your hand. <laughs> everyone should have your hand up. Hey, there you go. Yeah. All right, you can put your hands down. The reason I did that is because we all have a responsibility um, for family, for our family, for people younger than us. We all have a responsibility. Even if you don't have kids right now, if you have grandkids, if you have somebody in your life that's younger than you that needs some help, some mentoring, this, this message is for everyone here, not just for the parents with, with children. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to share a, little, a couple statistics with you guys about influence, what the influence the family has. And it's, it's actually probably, um, to me, it is comforting, and I'll explain why. Um, teenagers' biggest influence regarding appropriate behavior on social media websites or cell phones in 2011. Uh, parents is 58%, friends is 18%. Someone or something else, 5%. A classmate, 1%. So parents, 58%. That's huge, isn't it? Isn't that huge? So just say yes. I don't care if you believe me or not. Just say yes. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. And then there is, um, next slide, teenagers, when it comes to your decisions about sex, uh, who is the most influential? Parents, 38%. Friends, 22%. Media, 9%. Religious leaders, 6%. Siblings, 6%. Teachers and educators, 4%. Someone else, 10%. And the reason I share that is because parents is number one in both categories by a large margin. And this, not like this percentage is concrete, as, as everybody knows. It's, you know, they did some studies, but it's fluid. It really depends on how you're parenting, is what, how, what, how much influence you have on your kids. I mean, uh, one thing up there was media. And as parents, you actually have influence over that. You have influence over friends. So your influence can be much larger than that if you are thinking about that and doing that. And one thing, um, we also have to live our lives in a way to show our kids, our grandkids, that they are the most important to us. It's first things first. We need to put them first. When... I was a youth pastor. It was a great time. I loved the students. I love loved being with them. But I was working another job. Um, I'm an executive recruiter, and that doesn't usually go with youth pastor, but whatever. That's what I did. And so I worked there for probably about 40 to 50 hours a week, and I would be a youth pastor for 20 hours a week, sometimes more, depending. So I'd be gone for my family, you know, 60, 70 hours. And Levi, he's my middle child. He was a little younger at the time. And when he didn't get to spend time with Daddy, it affected him. Um, and I don't know if you guys see that in kids, your grandkids, but he started acting out. He started just doing, like, not being himself. And I would come home, and then he would say, oh, yay, Daddy's home. And then I'd have to go back to work. And I remember his face. His face would just be crushed. 
And I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. I, because I know this is what God called me to do right now. But when I would spend time with him, all of a sudden everything would change. I would take him out one on one. Everything changed. He would his 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 attitude, his behavior changed like that. It was amazing, amazing. And I decided to step down from being the youth pastor for my family. And it's been a you know it was it was hard to do because I love working with kids, but it also I believe shows them how important they are to me. It shows them that, and they need to see that. Our kids need to see that, not just from parents, but from grandparents. They need need that for us. They're there's so much out there. Now, when I was going through that statistic, and as I said, it's, it can be fluid. A lot of parents, you can have more influence, but you can also have a lot less. And a lot of people, as you know, there's been attack on family. Um, there's a lot of, you know, divorce is high. Um, there's other things that are going on with kids. When they don't have those parents, it creates a funnel a funnel of influence and other things media can that nine percent probably jumped up to sixty percent and we as a church are called to step in to that um, so the church needs to fill the gap in family in 2014 there were 415,129 kids in foster care and 107,918 waited to be adopted so that's about a half a million children in in that state and as a church, I wish that every foster parent was a strong believer. That is a huge influence we can have on that portion. That's a half a million people that we can affect. That's huge. And if God calls us to do that, and I'm going to read a couple verses. Psalm 82.3. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. James 1.27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Isn't that, now think of that. Religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless. That means, this is it, guys. This is what Christianity is about. Taking care of those in need. Taking care of the widows. And if we look around, you know, we don't call people widows anymore, but we have single parents, we have families going through hard, hard times. And as a family, as a church family, we need to come together and, and step up and, and be there for them. We have, um, I'm going to go over one more verse, and this verse is probably one that really speaks to my heart, and I'll explain why afterwards. Joshua 24, 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of the ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the god of the Amorites in whose lands you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That is a verse I pray over my children all the time. I pray over them, God, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. I don't care what anyone else does, but we are going to follow after God. And my kids, I'm going to do everything in my power that they know you, that they see you, and I hope, I pray that I can be you. Now, do I mess up all the time? Bethany, do I mess up? So you can say yes. I don't, apparently. <laughs> Woo! I don't mess up. That's awesome. So remember that. I'm going to remember that our next fight. And she had an opportunity, and she didn't take it. All right. Um, now, in closing, I want to talk about how do we put God first in our families? How do we do this as, as an everyday thing? Uh, number one, spend time in the Bible together. Your kids, no matter how, what their age is, they could be one years old. And I, Listen, I have a three-year-old who is crazy, so we'll be reading the Bible, and he's climbing on my head, hitting, Daddy, ah! I'm like, son, you don't understand. God loves you. And he's like, <laughs> What? No, and, but honestly, I mean, you can do it different ways. Um, a lot of times I'll even do, I'm, I'm weird, so I, we do, we act it out, and we'll do Dave and Goliath, and my kids throw things at my head, but it gets in there, but at the end, we actually go over what it means, and it sinks in. They get it. Uh, my son is six years old, Levi, and he gets things that are super deep. Sometimes he'll just say things randomly, and we're like, wow, 
That's pretty amazing that you understand that. So even if they're young, don't assume that they don't get it because they pick up on things all the time. So spend time. They need to see you spending time in the Bible alone too. So spend time as a family. Dig into the Word. That's what they need. They need God's love. And one thing, um, and my parents are here. If you want to, if you want to put your hands up, Mom and Dad, Jane and Jerry. Yeah, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, woo, good job. But one thing my dad would say to me or say to us as teenagers is, no matter if you disagree with me, me and Mom always have your interests at heart more than anybody else. We love you no matter what happens. That's huge. Our kids need to know that they have people in their lives who love them no matter what and have their interests. Even if you get into fights, they need to know that that's behind them. God's love is unconditional. They don't see that. A lot of people don't ever get to see that, and they don't get to understand what God is like because they don't have that in their lives, and they need that. Number two, spend time mentoring your kids and grandchildren. I go with my kids, we call it super spy missions, and we have levels, so it's weird. I'm not going to go into all that, but we go out, and we have fun, and we go to, like, grocery stores, and we sneak around, and people are looking at us weird, but I'm, like, hiding, and they're like, is anybody seeing us? And people all have this confused look, but my kids love it, and we go out to eat, and, you know, they're young yet, so our conversations are a little weird, but, you know, what's the best part of your day? Well, when I... I got to play with Legos. Well, that's good. You know, I, but I talk to them. They know that I love them. Even though it doesn't seem important at the time, it is. It's huge to them. And mentoring for teenagers. I was a youth pastor for, you know, two and a half years. I've worked with students. Going out with teenagers can be hard. It can be hard. It can be awkward. I've gone out with them and was sat at the table the whole time, and it's silent. And I'm like, hey, how are you? Good. All right, well. Where do you go to school? Uh, Millard. Oh, that's awesome, you know, and it'll be sit there awkward, and I go home thinking, oh, I, that was horrible. I don't know what I just did. I'm sure he hates me forever. He's probably never going to talk to me again. That next week, he comes, uh, his parents come to me, oh, JJ, thank you so much. That meant so much to him. I'm like, really? <laughs> but yes, it does. It means so much to them. It means so impactful. So if people around, if you see a teenager who needs that, take a step of faith, go out with them, ask them to do something with you. If it goes horrible, it means so much to them no matter what. It really, really does. Number three, be careful on what influences your children. There is so much out there right now. This probably, my wife could talk about this for about five hours, and she has to me a lot, but... Be careful on what influences your kids. You can't go on and turn on just the Disney Channel and play it in front of your kids all the time. Don't do that. There's, there, there's messages in there. They're trying to sneak in there. What we pour into our kids' heads matters. It matters. It grows them. It's what they think about. We have that influence over it. Don't give it away. Don't give it away to whatever is on TV. Watch it first. Show it to them afterwards. It's okay to have fun. My, I, li- I love to do stuff like that, but be careful. Don't give up that influence. Don't do it. Number four, take care of the widows and orphans. Let's, as a church, me and Bethany, um, we've been praying about what does God want us to do? I'm, you know, I started my own business a week ago, so that's going there. But what do we want us to do? And he's really laid this one on our hearts. Pure religion is this. Um, so, you know, we, we're not doing it yet, but... Down the road, we're going to do either foster care, adopt, because that's what God wants. That's pure religion. We can, you can change somebody's life forever. We have that power. We have the power to change, pour God into them and take somebody down a path, show them God's heart. That's, that's huge. That is gigantic. Um, and today, I just want to talk, I want, I'm going to pray real quick, and Pastor Chris is going to come up afterwards, but... I want you guys to think about what does God want you to do, whether you, if you have little kids, how, and think about this, how do I influence them, how do I show God's love to them, be intentional about it, you have, God has given that, poured that on you, when you have kids, whether you like it or not, you have that responsibility now, grandparents, great grandparents, pour in, I know every grandparent loves their grandkids, but think about how you can influence them, you have a you have a huge place, and 
for those people who don't have that huge support system, let's step out. Let's be there for them. And I want you guys to think about one thing that God is laying on your heart. What does God want me to do with, with for families, for family, our church family today? Dear Lord, I just want to pray for our, our next generation, Lord. They're going through so much, so much. I want to pray, Lord, that you use us to influence them. You use us to pour our your love. Let, let us shine with your love to them. Give us that, Lord. Let us influence them to you, Lord. And let's change this next generation. Let's change them for you, Lord. In your name, amen.